Hi, I'm Stephen Capsuto, the author of Alternate Channels, Queer Images on 20th Century TV. And a lot of the recordings I gathered as background research for the book are really interesting and historically important and very revealing and in really terrible sound. Recordings, for example, of early gay activists like Barbara Giddings or Frank Kameny, who was an activist. Both of them were activists starting in the 50s. And there are recordings of them. And in many cases, the sound is just very hard to listen to. Either it's tinny or it's muffled or it just generally sounds like someone talking from the bottom of a trash can. And I had hoped that someone would come up with AI software that can fix that. And it exists. I'm Barry Farber. And the subject we're about to discuss tonight is one which is so commonly uh, sensationalized and so easy. I'm Barry Farber, and the subject we're about to discuss tonight is one which is so commonly uh, sensationalized and so easy to sensationalize and so hard not to over-sensationalize that I'm not even going to tell you what it is right away. This program that Adobe is developing called Project Shasta, it's not perfect yet. It has a lot of problems, but that it's this good amazes me. Uh, so we're going to hear two little clips from 1967. One is Frank Kameny on the radio talking about his attempts to get the U.S. government to stop firing people for being gay. And the other is Barbara Giddings, also in 67, trying to get a straight radio talk show host who had just said, well, if you just don't tell anybody that you're a homosexual, then you won't have any problems. And this is her trying to explain to him that being in the closet is emotionally wearing and not very healthy and much more difficult than he thinks it is. In both cases, what it sounds like is not so much the person's natural voice, but it sounds like somebody doing a really creditable Frank Kameny or Barbara Giddings impression. That's something. Five years from now, the tech will be much better. Was there any uh, government official who wasn't speaking for the government, but just speaking for himself, ever look you in the face snarling me and say, oh, no, I ain't going to deal with no queer if I cry uh, They haven't said it in quite that attitude, but uh, in quite that manner. However, in the case of the Civil Service Commission, for example, we wrote to them back in 1962 asking as citizens, as American citizens, as first-class citizens in a country that claims it does not have second-class citizens, uh, asking to meet with them to discuss what we felt to be our grievances. This is proper. And one expects that our government will do it. After all, uh, Governor Wallace a few years back finally met with Negroes in Alabama. Why shouldn't our own government meet with its homosexual citizens? And we got back a letter from Mr. Macy, the chairman of the commission, saying that the conference for which you ask would serve no useful purpose. And we continued to write through 1962 and 1963 and on into 1964. And then we gave up for a bit. And we wrote again in April of 1965, and Mr. Macy wrote back saying, we have just reconsidered our policies with regard to homosexuals and have decided not to change them. And we wrote back and said that we thought under our American system, when you consider policies which are going to affect large groups of citizens, you consult the citizens involved. We are not aware of a single homosexual citizen who was consulted in your reconsideration of this policy. We got no answer. So then we wrote to Mr. Macy and said we are, our plans are well advanced to picket the Civil Service Commission. We much prefer negotiation and discussion to demonstration. We are always ready to negotiate and discuss, but it takes two sides to do so. Will you meet with us? And we got no answer. So we prepared to picket. And we usually send out a press release before we picket. We, most of our demonstrations were on Saturdays. But the press release usually goes out on a Wednesday. 72 hours before that, and this is our standard practice, we're not trying to create, we, we again must prefer a constructive approach than just uh, to create dissension. We've sent Mr. Macy a copy of the press release saying this is being sent to you 72 hours before it is being sent to anybody else anywhere. We still prefer to meet with you rather than to pick it. Will you meet with us? And we got back a letter saying the meeting for which you request will serve no useful purpose. So we picketed and got publicity. Following this, we sent, uh, after this, we sent a follow-up letter. And the follow-up letter said, in effect, but in much smoother language than I'm about to use, said, in effect, well, we said we were going to pick it, and we did. Now will you meet with us? And three years to the day after we sent our first letter, we got back a letter saying, we will meet with you. Uh, 
That is what it takes for American citizens, first-class citizens, to deal with their public officials when homosexuality comes into the matter. You know, like, uh, if, if amongst, uh, with the person who is a homosexual, there's always this denial. Always. And Barbara very adequately pointed to the huge cultural price that society as a whole pays and, and the astronomical price that homosexuals themselves pay. It's a waste of human resources, if nothing else. Well, I think we are all uh, wasting human resources. Uh, as you know, don't you believe that most of us wear masks all the time? Not in the same sense that the homosexuals do, because this kind of a mask is one that you have to wear constantly, day in and day out, and you can only drop it when you're with your own kind. Well, I understand that, but I think most of us uh, wear masks most of the time and only drop it when we're at home or with people that we know. I think, though, um, Mr. Burnett, the kind of mask that you're talking about may be the kind of mask of public manners more than a mask of a completely different image of your person. Right. Now, you go out in the morning, and you're, you're not going to treat everybody you meet on the street or at your office, whatever it might be, the, the way you would uh, relax with your wife at home. Correct. Because you're, that's a domestic situation. It's easygoing. Uh, you're, you're uh, you know, in your own home situation. I'm you go out. My animal. All right. You go out, and uh, you put on a certain kind of a mask, but it is a, it's a, just a small little mask of polite manners. We all do this, but the homosexual has fa a far larger burden that he has to cope with. The day in, day out pretense that he is something that he basically is not. And if you, ca if you have never lived as a homosexual, it is very difficult to explain this. And I like to like, I've been on this show many, many times, maybe 10 uh, at least, well, I went to tell me, and I will say that I will say that this is probably the most most significant discussion we've ever had on this show about homosexuality. And I'd be very happy to stay right with this particular topic because this discussion of the mass are overwhelming. The homosexual, the, this particular this question of the mask that the homosexual has to has to wear, must wear, in in probably ninety percent of his of his waking hours and probably some of his sleeping hours. Uh, is is the greatest price that the homosexual has to pay. <laughs>